What happened was he first asked, answered the question, what were the signs that pertained to the destruction of Solomon's temple till one stone would not be left upon another? And he warned them that when you see armies that are in the hills around Jerusalem, he said, don't go back into your house to get your clothes. Flee immediately to the mountain. And so if you read the book of Acts, know that you have read the book of Acts, then you'll know that there, were, there was about, within a period of about 20 years after Jesus had gone back to heaven, the ascension, that the gospel of Jesus had so thoroughly saturated Jerusalem that about half, like 50%, like one out of every two of the Jewish priests that had been guilty of sentencing Jesus to death, about half of them repented and embraced Jesus as the Messiah. And a great number of the people that lived in Jerusalem had become Christians. In 70 AD, that's about, not quite, almost 40 years after Jesus went to heaven, there was a man whose name was Titus who led a Roman army because there had been a rebellion of the Jews against the Roman government. And so Titus, this Roman general, brought the armies and they went across the Mount of Olives. And if you would have been standing in the, uh, on the wall of Jerusalem, you could look to the east and you could have seen that the hills were lined with Roman soldiers. And that was a sign to you. Jesus had given it, said, when you see the armies encamped around about Jerusalem, don't go back in your house. You take what you can get your hands on and you flee to the mountain. And many, many Christian believers did just that. They fled and they escaped with their lives because they heeded the words of Jesus. That was fulfilled actually in 70 A.D. Jesus began to talk about things like wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes in divers places, pestilence. And then he said, these are the beginning of sorrows. And uh, the term sorrow would be the same term that would, be, that would refer to a woman who was with child and beginning to have the um, contractions and then later labor pains that would bring forth a child. And just as birth pains on a woman with child become more intense and closer together as he gets closer and closer to the day of that baby being delivered, or the hour, the moment of that baby being delivered, even so those signs that pertain now to Jesus' second coming, not, not the rapture, the second coming. Some of you may not have realized that there were two distinct groups of, uh, of uh, prophecies, one talking about when Jesus will come in the clouds when the saints will be raptured to meet him and a second pertain to when Jesus will actually come back to the earth, the second coming when he will reign then for a thousand years. And these signs per pertain to the second coming, more uh, closer together, more intense. These signs will come until the day when Jesus will appear riding on a white horse with 10,000s of his saints, riding on horses and make their appearance, and Jesus will make a physical return to planet Earth. His feet will touch down on the same mountain that he left from, the Mount of Olives, and an earthquake will cause that mountain to be divided north and south and will make an east and west passage that will go from that mount across the Kidron Valley to the eastern gate that's now been sealed up by Islamics. We know there's no extremist. 
But Islamics have sealed up that wall to try to prevent the Messiah from entering that gate. They have made a cemetery in front of that gate, dead bodies that would be an attempt to keep the Messiah from coming in that gate. But when Jesus' feet touches the Mount of Olive, the Bible tells us that that mount will be divided north and south. It will create a valley that will run east and west and will tear apart all the resistance at the eastern gate and Jesus will walk directly to the temple mount where his kingdom will be established for a thousand years. And so when you talk about the signs that point to the rapture of the church, which is really what most people are interested in, there is no sign about the rapture. There is not a sign. I know I've watched some of those people that you've watched on TV and I sit with bewilderment when they have all these signs that, pur that purportedly point to the rapture of the church. When, when Paul talked to the Corinthian church about the rapture, do you remember what his words were in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse number 51? He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this mortal must put on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruption. He was talking about the mystery of the catching away of the church. Jesus said to to uh, Martha at the tomb of Lazarus. He who lives and believes in me shall never die. Those people that fall asleep in Jesus, he's the resurrection. They will rise again. But for those of us who are alive at the rapture, we shall never die. Amen. That's the blessed hope. Of the church. Amen. We well, wanted to remind you that what we said last week is it is impossible, according to Matthew 24 and verse 36 and many other similar verses, it is impossible for us to know the day or the hour when Jesus will, in fact, come again. We can't know the day or the hour. Jesus said that no man knows the day or the hour. In fact, he went on to say on that place that even the angels don't know the day or the hour. I want to tell you that in the Gospel of, Ma Gospel of Mark, he goes on to say an astounding thing. I'm gonna, I didn't elaborate on, that, on this last week, but I'm going to this week. He said, no man knows the day or the hour. The angels don't know. He said in Mark, even the Son does not know when the rapture will take place. Someone says, well, that's impossible. The Son is God. If he's God, he should know everything. I don't understand how God does this, but I know that God does it. He is greater than you are. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your hot thoughts. And things that you would think are impossible are completely possible with God. You say, well, God knows everything. God knows everything that he chooses to know. And if you want to know how in the world does the Father know the hour, the moment that the rapture will take place, yet the son does not know. The only thing I can tell you is I'm thankful that there's things that God chooses not to know. I'm thankful for the promise that says that when I have come to Jesus and repented of my sins, he removes them farther than the east is from the west. I love to tell you today that he not only removes my sins, but he buries my sins in the sea of God's forgetfulness. Some folks didn't even know that existed, but I'm glad to tell you that the sea of God's forgetfulness exists. God knows everything he wants to know, but I'm glad that he can forget some things on purpose. He's forgotten about your sins. When you have repented and asked Jesus to come into your life, the devil will often try to tell you about your past. Just remind him about his future. 
And God does not bring your past out of that sea of forgetfulness. He said, I'll not, not only does he say, I'll bury your sins in the depths of the sea of God's forgetfulness, but he, then he goes on to say, and they will never be brought up against you again. When God forgets something, they st those things stay forgotten. Amen? Tell you what, some people think they know everything, and that's because you can't know what you don't know. You thought you knew everything. You just didn't know. You don't know what you don't know. And how many believe you can't remember what you forgot? And God has forgotten your sins, and they'll never be brought up against you again. And Jesus has by his will decided to leave the moment, the day, the hour of his coming in God's, the Father's own power. And the reason I emphasize that so strong this morning is I want you to know that if no man knows and if no angels know and if Jesus doesn't know, then all those teachers that you've heard preach on prophecy on television, they might think they know, but they don't know. Amen. And I don't today come to tell you when Jesus is coming, but because I confess that I don't know the day or the hour. But I'm telling you that though the Lord has not revealed to us the day or the hour, he has certainly told us the times and the seasons. During my lifetime, and I've been preaching the gospel for over 40 years, I have preached literally, this is not an exaggeration, when I tell you that I have preached literally hundreds of sermons in which I dealt on the signs that pertain to the coming of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you that I have often said to people, now Jesus is coming soon. I've been saying that for over 40 years. And so maybe I would like, if I had a chance, I would have liked to have made a little correction in what I said. In fact, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't alarm God that I said that Jesus was coming soon. With God, one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years like one day. It hadn't seemed like so long to him. But literally 40 years is more than a lifetime for many people. And for me to say for 40 years Jesus is coming soon would be a stretch in the mortal minds of some people. When Jesus comes, the people who are left behind will think, boy, it happened too soon. But as far as those people that have been waiting anxiously for his return now for 40 years, they might say it really wasn't all that soon. So I wished I could go back and I would correct what I said if I could. And what I would say indifferently is instead of saying Jesus is coming soon, I would say Jesus is coming quickly. The message I have for the church today is Jesus is coming quickly. I believe that we know that we're in that generation that will see his return. And when he comes... It will be in, the, in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye and there will not be an opportunity for someone to make an adjustment in how they live at the moment of his coming. There will not be an opportunity for someone to pray a prayer that they intended to pray. There will not be an opportunity to say the sinner's prayer or to ask forgiveness. There won't be an opportunity to go to a brother or sister and make something right that's been wrong between you. There will not be an opportunity on that day to go and share the gospel of Jesus with someone that does not know about his coming. There will not be an opportunity for personal evangelism. There won't be an opportunity to give a gift. Hey, you know, last week I mentioned, I said, you know, if we knew for sure that Jesus was going to come today, would that make you do things differently? You know, everybody wants to certainly be everything right with God when Jesus comes. I said a lot of people would probably pay their back tithe. I mean, 
they, the, the bills will never come due tomorrow anyway. So go ahead and catch up today because Jesus is coming. But we don't know. We don't know when that hour will be. Instead, we understand that when it comes, it will be quick and sudden. And so whatever condition we want our soul to be in when Jesus comes, that is the way we need to stay. We need to stay ever vigilant and ever ready. The, the uh, signs that we mentioned, let me try to go through this quickly because I don't want to take as much time with them today as last week or else we'll be in the same condition. We'll get to the end of the message and when we get to the two greatest signs, we'll be out of time again. So I want to tell you that there are, first of all, minor signs that Matthew chapter 24 calls birth pains. There are false messiahs. That began actually before Jesus. People that came and claimed to be the Messiah and failed to produce the goods. That happened as early as uh, the, the days of the Maccabees, people claiming to be the Messiah, but they were not. That has become very prevalent today, those that profess to be the anointed one. And uh, more and more rapidly, these false Christ are presenting themselves. Wars and rumors of war. You know, besides the war that has captivated our attention, around the globe, there are so many border skirmishes. It, it really blows the mind. Now, we, we, of course, know about ISIS that has taken large sloths of territory through Syria and Iraq and of other locations in the world that they have gained a foothold. Across the continent of Africa are no less than three large regimes that are uh, taking areas, holding cities, holding hostages. We don't hear about those because our attention in our 30-minute news report is too focused on other areas that are seemingly more pertinent. So it causes us to overlook that there's not just the few wars that we are involved as at, uh, with as a nation, but there are countless other border wars uh, just like the Ukrainian-Russian battle that we do hear about, arguing about the, where the border should be between countries, should Crimea be part of Russia or, uh, or, or should it remain um, in the government that is now under, that type of battle is surfaced all around the globe, wars and rumors of wars, and the scripture also warns about famines, pestilence, and earthquakes intensifying that mark the last days. All of these things are telling us that the end is approaching. In verse 9 of chapter 24 of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus even tells about Christian persecution. Before this service is over today, at the end of the service, when we have an opportunity to join our hearts together in prayer, I, I, in my mind that we would pray for the 21 Christians and their families, not for the Christians themselves, they're in heaven, but their families, the 21 Christians beheaded because of their testimony of the Lordship of Jesus. But before I could get here today, and announced that we were going to pray for those 21 families. 46 other families now have been bereaved of their Christian loved ones who were burnt alive just last night for their testimony of Christianity. That is one of the signs that tells us that this thing is winding down and we are getting closer and closer to the end. The thing that I talked about last week week, the three items that I talked about last week that got more hits on our website and, and more questions that were asked and more interest stirred were not these uh, signs that I've just shared with you, but things were a little bit more, I call them cult, pop, uh, cult almost pop culture type of uh, signs that point to the end time. And spoke about the, the uh, Pope of Rome that the prophets called Peter of Rome. 
Talked about the blood moons, the unusual situation where on the four major, the two major feasts, four in a row, two in successive years, during the time of the uh, atonement and the time of the Passover feast, the, the Jews experienced the moon turning to blood on four of these in a row. And so much that phenomena, it, that's, a, that's a very rare thing. But beyond that has been the events that followed the first two. Now, the next two, according to uh, astro astronomers, the next two will also be blood moons. And the last two brought horrific results against the enemies of the Jews. Makes me want to make sure when judgment comes that my country is considered a friend of the Jews. There's two more of these coming. It hasn't gone well for the Jews' enemies, the last two. There's two more coming. It would be a good idea that someone in Washington made a point of saying that we're still the friends of Israel. Amen? Just a suggestion that maybe we would want to be identified as a friend. And then the, the red heifer, and I think that probably that interested me more than anybody else. So I'll just go on and say, these signs all tell us that we're moving into a different period in history. I could quickly go over uh, changes that have taken place beginning with Adam and coming to now, but I will save that for another day. And simply tell you that we're moving into a different period of God's dealing with men, a different. Jesus said to his disciples, that when you see these signs begin to come to pass, lift up your head because that generation will not pass away until all these things have been fulfilled. That is an astounding realization. And for all those naysayers that have walked in these last days, as we read in the third chapter of Second Peter, walked after their own lusts, and said, where's the sign of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things have remained the same since the beginning of the creation. Now, see, Peter said that those people would be going forth in the last days, and they're here. Those people said, I've always heard people talk about the coming of the Lord, but he's never come. He's only coming once. It's not going to be like you're going to experience the rapture for the fourth or fifth time during your life. It's only happening once. Someone says, well, it hadn't happened yet. You're right. But be this known to you, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to you, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the reason that we've heard this message sound a warning Time and time again, get ready, get ready. Jesus is coming. It's not because the Lord hasn't been able to come. It's not because he hasn't decided when to come. It's because he's patient and he's long-suffering and he's not willing that any should perish. He's left the door open for you to get in and get ready. And that's why we've waited this long. I want to tell you the two great signs, and these, among all others, remain as God's greatest witness that we are living in the end time. I'd like for you to turn with me to the prophet Joel. The, the prophet Joel, his outstanding ministry, he first pronounced judgment upon Israel. He's the one that told about the great army of caterpillars and canker worms and palmer worms and locusts that would march one after another against the land of Israel until in front of this army, it looked like the Garden of Eden. But after they passed through, behind them it looked like a desert. 
And he's the one that prophesied that after the um, restoration came, that God would restore the years that the caterpillar had eaten. He would restore the years that the palmer worm and the canker worm had eaten. He'd restore everything that the locusts had eaten. He would not only let the country be revived, but he'd give them back the years that they had set empty. He's the one that gave the prophecy that pertains to Israel coming home to their homeland. And so if you look at Joel chapter number 2, beginning with verse 18, the prophet says, Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them, and I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. But I will remove far from you the northern army, and I will drive him away into a barren and a desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. I remember like it was yesterday, I was a child, when my daddy drew his three children, me and my brother and my sister, into the den of our house and told us, Today, he said, today Israel, the armies, have done what they've never done before. From their settlements along the Jordan River, they have pursued their army back into Jerusalem, but in the past they would stop at Jerusalem. In the six-day war, they took over Jerusalem, and they ran the enemies back across the Sinai Peninsula and had come to the very brink of the Nile River. And you that remember this day, remember that the United Nations then stepped in and, and asked Israel, stop here, do not invade Egypt. And General Mashdion in a helicopter sat down on the Mount of Moriah where Solomon's temple had sat. And he prayed the historic prayer that said, to this land we have come, and from this city we will never leave again. I'm not sure when the prophecies that Jesus gave began to come to pass. But what most people do not really recall was that before 1948, you would not find the name Israel anywhere on the map of the Middle East. Israel was not a nation. As a result of their backsliding and turning against God and as a result of the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah, they had been taken into dispersion. They had been chased around the four corners of the world. They had become a byword. The name Jew was a joke with most people. They had been persecuted in every land and rejected. What some of you here today will still have memory of was during World War II when six million individuals were put to death in gas chambers by Hitler for no other crime except that they were born of Jewish descent. And there was no Israel. People that studied the books of prophecy would read about Israel in the prophetical, uh, the prophetical books of the Bible and they assumed that that was symbolic of the church. That's why so many people today have a hard time getting their prophecy in order because it was based on the idea that the scriptures that referred to Israel referred, meant the church because it wasn't an Israel. What they hadn't counted on was nothing's too hard for the Lord. And when the Lord says he's going to call them back from the north and south and east and west to their homeland and a nation will be born again in a day, God is able to bring his word to pass. And so on May the 15th, 1948, by an act of the British Parliament, Israel was given permission 
to establish their own government in Palestine and a nation was born in a day and Israel became a country again. And we have seen millions of people pack up from their homes across Europe, across the tiers of the, north, of the northern countries of Africa, from Asia, and from the United States of America, they've come back to Palestine, back to the homeland, and they have been established as a country again. As I mentioned, the war back in the 1960s, six-day war, when Israel retook the city of Jerusalem. In 1981, they made the proclamation that Jerusalem, not Tel Aviv, but, but Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. And so it remains to this day, and so it will be forever. And this is one of the great signs that we're living in the last days. I'm simply saying to you, when Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, lift up your head, that generation will not pass away till all these things have been fulfilled. I don't know exactly which sign would have triggered the countdown for the last generation, but I'm quite certain that by now, 1948, when Israel became a nation again, 1967, when they retook Jerusalem, 1981, when they proclaimed that Jerusalem would be forever the eternal capital of Israel, or if it would be 2015, one week ago, when the prime minister would give a call to all of Europe and say, we want the Jews to come home to their homeland and we will pay the bill for you to come and appropriated funds to pay their passage back to move home to Israel. These are marked. We're living in the last generation. I'm talking to you about the major, the most major signs that we're living in the last days. The other sign also comes from the book of Joel chapter number two. The first, the return of Israel. But after that, and I'm gonna need to check here on my time. I don't want to get it. I don't want to get away from me. I want you to get all this. In, in uh, chapter 2, beginning with verse 28, Joel says, And it will come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my, hand, and my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out of my spirit in those days and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming and great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Talking about this prophecy is about a latter outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is marked by prophecy that the old men will prophesy and have dreams and the young men will prophesy and see visions. The ladies and the men will be used in this great outpouring in the last days. Handmaidens will prophesy. Men servants will prophesy a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the last days. Now, maybe you remember, and because this has caused confusion down through the years, maybe you remember that actually Peter prophesied or, or gave this prophecy in his sermon on the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of the book of Acts. When the multitude gathered around the 120 the followers of Jesus that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the great sound like a rushing mighty wind and fire appeared burning over the heads of the 120 that were being filled with the Holy Spirit and they all 120 began to speak in other languages as the Spirit empowered them to speak. And it caused such a crowd of thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem to see this great sight, to see the fire burning, to hear the wind, the sound of wind, 
and to hear them speaking in 15 countries said we hear them speaking in our own language and magnifying God. And, and so a few doubters and scoffers said, these people are not being moved on by God. They're just full of new wine. They're drunk. And that's when Peter stood up and he gave this message. He said, men and brethren, these men are not drunken as you suppose. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That it will come to pass, Peter said, in the last day, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. You say, well, it's the same prophecy. Well, it is, except you need to take note of how it is slightly worded different. Joel's prophecy was originally given in Hebrew language. When Peter preached, he was preaching in the Greek language. And you hear this difference. Joel said, it will come to pass afterwards, saith God. Joel, and and um, Peter said, it will happen in the last day. And that's a, that's a major difference. I want you to pay attention to what Joel said. He was just given this prophecy that I just read to you a minute ago about the, Israel, about the Jews returning to their homeland. Then he said, it will come to pass afterwards that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Many people that have not believed in this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we're experiencing these days, many people have said that that prophecy was fulfilled with Peter. No, it wasn't. It could not have been fulfilled with Peter. You say, but Peter said it was. No, he didn't. Pay attention to what he says. Joel said, it will come to pass after I've pulled the, the nation of Israel back to, to the homeland. Afterwards, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Peter said, this is the same thing that Joel was talking about. This is that that Joel was talking about. Was that the fulfillment of it? No. It wasn't the fulfillment of it, but it was the same thing. It couldn't be the fulfillment of it because the Jews hadn't been pulled back into the homeland yet. And Joel's prophecy was, I'm going to pour out my spirit after the Jews have gone back home. You're either really taking this in or else you don't really quite get what I'm telling you today. What I'm saying is, this prophecy was made not for Peter. It was made for you. Peter said, this is the same thing that's going to happen in the last day. But the Jews hadn't got home yet, so this is not the fulfillment. This is the fulfillment. Did you hear what I said? Today, these days are the fulfillment of what Joel was talking about. That's what marks these days as the end time. This what lets us know that the coming of the Lord is certainly earmarked for our generation. The Lord is coming back. We can't tell you when because it's not in our ability to know, but we can tell you that it's coming back in our time. Every century since the days of Jesus has experienced the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There's not been a century yet when God did not move among some people that were hungry. And in most cases, there were those examples of people who spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. This latter reign of the Holy Ghost is not really the fulfillment of, uh, it was not the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy when Peter uh, experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Nor was it the fulfillment when many centuries after Peter, folks such as the Waldrons, received a manifestation of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Those were not the fulfillment because it could not be fulfilled until after Israel had returned. I'm going to tell you something that Americans find a little bit hard to believe. And I am talking to you from the authority the scholarship of the Encyclopedia Britannica. In that work that's strictly secular, just, it's just uh, the demographics, it tells us that among the people of the world, a, a little bit over half of the world's population are Christians. 
Now, that don't mean they're born again. That means that they believe in the God of the Bible. And about half of them, the, the number of uh, Christians are just about divided in half worldwide. About half of the Christians are Catholic and about half are Protestant. But between the two groups, Protestant and uh, Catholic, makes up about half of the world's population. That's not too astounding, but perhaps what is astounding, that also half of the Christians in the world profess to having received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and experience speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. Now, in the United States, that probably would not be the proportion, but a great number, a great percentage of people have experienced it. I don't tell you that today to try to win you over and say, man, the Pentecostals must be right. That's not the point. I don't really think that has anything to do with this message today. This message today is the saying that what God promised is happening, that he's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Around the world today, people are receiving this infilling of the Holy Spirit, being empowered by God and that is indicative that the prophecy, after the Jews have returned to their homeland, that prophecy is now being fulfilled. You see, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is necessity. The power of the Holy Ghost in the church is needed for the end-time harvest of souls that has to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. I know that... When it comes to the message that Jesus is uh, the Messiah, the gospel of Christ, that the message will still be preached to a number of people that never heard it before after the rapture of the church. But I can also tell you that it seems evident by the scriptures that it's going to be a worldwide message that every nation is going to have an opportunity to hear this gospel, some level of witness of who Jesus is prior even to the rapture of the church. After the rapture takes place, everyone will hear. The angels will even proclaim it. In case any nation or kindred or tongue of people have not yet heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself sends an angel who has the everlasting gospel to preach unto them who yet dwell on the earth after the rapture, during the tribulation, during the kingdom of Antichrist, the angels will preach it and no one will go without hearing the witness of Jesus and his gospel before the Lord actually physically returns to the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit on the church is the sanctifier. I've got news for you people that might have been kind of concerned that God had become lax in these last days. There are some people that seems to think that God in his old age has gotten a lot easier to get along with. Kind of reminds you of the grandparents, you know. The grandparents have gotten a lot softer on the grandkids than they were on us. You know what I'm talking about? You don't remember? You don't have a, you don't identify with that? My mom and dad would beat the fire out of me for the things they laugh at when they see my kids do it. And I realize, somebody said, well, they've just gotten softer in their old age. No, they hadn't. They're just old. And they're trying to get into heaven. So they're acting a lot nicer than they used to act. I'm playing with you on that one. But a lot of people have this idea about God like he's gotten soft. He used to be real strict, but now he's kind of lenient. Don't you believe that? That's a lie of the devil. And I'm telling you that it's the power of the Holy Spirit moving in the church today that's going to sanctify the church, going to wash the church with the water of the word, going to prepare the church to be a glorious bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And we would be blameless when Jesus presents that bride in heaven to his Father. Can you say amen to that? The power of the Holy Spirit in these days. It's the power that's going to resurrect the church. Now, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up right here, but I want to tell you this is an important thing. The power of the Holy Ghost is needful in the church in these last days. Why? The greatest miracle that I have found in all the scripture is the rapture of the church. Let me tell you why I say that. 
Up till now, the greatest miracle that has ever been performed was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing compares to it. In the Old Testament, you will find the testimony of three individuals that were graveyard dead. Fact is, one of them was being buried when he touched the bones of the prophet and came back to life. And they were resurrected. But Jesus was a greater miracle than all of those. In the ministry of Jesus, you will read the story specifically. There may have been many others. But the Bible records the story of three that Jesus raised from the dead. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. The widow of Nain's son was raised from the dead. And of course, the dramatic call of Lazarus after being in the grave for four days. But even after four days, what happened in Jesus was a greater miracle than what happened in Lazarus. After Jesus went to heaven, the Bible talks about New Testament saints that raised the dead. There were miracles of the dead being raised, recorded in the book of Acts, after Jesus was already in heaven, and they were great miracles. But Jesus being raised from the dead was greater than all them. Why? Well, because all of those other people that, that were raised from the dead would all have to die again. They weren't resurrected. They were just revived. When they came back to life, they were still in their natural, corruptible, mortal bodies. They were still subject to time and space. They were still subject to sicknesses, diseases, injury, pain, and ultimately they all died again. All died again. Not Jesus. When Jesus came out of the grave, do you remember that great story? A stone was rolled back. Jesus didn't walk out of the tomb. When the stone was rolled back, it revealed that the tomb was empty already because Jesus couldn't be held by death, couldn't be held by grave clothes. The stone itself, the seal of the Roman government, nothing could hold Jesus. He was alive. He was gone when the stone was rolled back. A glorified body. He never saw corruption. His body was the first fruits of the resurrection. And he would never suffer again. He would never be hungry again. He'd never be tired. He wasn't limited to time or space. They had the doors shut the night of the, uh, the first resurrection day. Had the doors shut, the windows barred. They were all huddled inside afraid. And Jesus just appeared in their midst because he couldn't be held out anymore. He was a glorified body, the first fruit of the resurrection, the greatest miracle that's ever happened. He defeated the power of sin and of death when he rose victorious over it. Death, where's your victory? Death, where's your sting? Jesus has beaten it. Now, that happened one time, but it's getting ready to happen again. The greatest miracle in all of history will be when every believer in Jesus that has ever lived and are asleep in the graves, their bodies have decomposed. Their bones have, many of them, wasted back to dust. They lay sleeping. And at the same time, the saints that are alive never have died in one split second of time, those bodies in various stages of decomposing from all the ages will be quickened and come back together. The mortal will become immortal. The corruptible bodies will take on incorruption. And we who are alive will be changed in a split second of time from mortal to immortal. John said, we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. These mortal bodies will become immortal in a split second of time and the dead of all the ages in Christ will be quickened and come back to life and will never be sick, will never be weary, will never be hungry, they'll never be thirsty, they'll never be bound by time or space but glorified. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection and we will be made like him in one split second of time, the greatest miracle that has ever taken place in the history of mankind.
That's why we need the Holy Ghost. Now see, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, I'm going to quickly close here. In the book of Romans, chapter numbers, uh, let, me get, let me get you to chapter number 8 and verse 11. If the spirit of him that raised Christ up from the dead dwell in you, then he who raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. That's why this thing has come together the way it has. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit for the end time, for these last days, to get the church ready. And when it happens, no man knows the day. The angels don't know. Jesus really doesn't know. But the Father knows. And he's put this thing together so that in one split second of time, the great miracle of all the ages takes place and we're all changed in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye. I'd like for you to stand with me, please, across this building to this, this morning. The greatest sign, and we've seen it, and we're aware of it. You will not know more about the coming of the Lord than what you know right now in terms of when it's going to happen. You can't know the day or the hour, but we do know that these are, in fact, the times and the seasons. And we need to know that he's coming quickly. And when he comes, we must already be ready. We will not be able to get ready then. We must already be ready.